OJ lied to you. I'm not going into Revelation. You might need your Bible, by the way. You got it all memorized? <laughs> all right. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 3. We'll go through verse 12 here today. I did want to go right back into Revelation, but, um, you know, what I usually do at the beginning of the year is do a prophecy update, and I didn't want to go back into Revelation and then back out of it again to do uh, something different. Uh, I do like to do kind of a uh, set the stage for a a vision for our church for the next coming year, and and that's what I'd like to do today as we've uh, done this particular series a couple of times now this idea of pastors, pulpits, and parishioners, just the whole idea of the church, the body of Christ, and, and uh, the function of the body, and, and the way that things are to happen scripturally within the body, within the church. And uh, I do want to look to that in this coming year as we, uh, as we think about New Year's resolutions, right? You're all kind of making your New Year, New Year resolutions already and thinking about you know, losing weight and, and the other things that we always talk about. Uh, but I want to talk about that in a spiritual perspective, and a lot of this comes from uh, the blog I wrote a couple weeks ago now, or last week anyway, and uh, I was going to print it out and have it out for you, and if you're interested in reading that, I can get it to you, but uh, just the whole idea was that the church really, as God designed it to be, is really the place where we can come and we can have a sense of belonging within the body. Uh, a place where people care for us, a place that people love us and, and care for our needs and those kind of things. And I really believe that that's what God had intended the Bible or the, uh, the church to be. And uh, as we go forward into the coming year, I really want us to focus in on that in a very powerful way. You know, we uh, have been working on this building and you see that video we just showed about the working on the, the structure of the building. Um, and, you know, my heart has always been that we grow closer together in unity, and I believe that that has happened in the last year, and we have also grown in numbers uh, to a degree, but my heart for the coming year is that we grow closer together in, in the biblical sense of, you know, just really starting to love for each other and uh, build that um, uh, belonging, that sense of belonging that we have with one another, so that as the world comes in and they see that, that should be something that stirs a hunger within them. It's like uh, salt, you know, they just have a desire. Boy, these people love each other. You know, I want to be a part of this. They, they have a, a sense of belonging here. They, they care for each other, and I really want to be a part of that. And so I, I really believe that that's what the church is supposed to be. As the people uh, saw the church initially in the first century there, they saw this loving group of people, and they had a hunger to be a part of it, and they did uh, come in, in large numbers Uh, And that was part of the reason, because of the unity, because of the love for each other, because of the care that was there in that early church as they sold their own possessions to take care of the needs of others. And and I'm I'm not saying that that's what we're going to do in the coming year, sell all of our possessions, but certainly there's a practical side of that, a practical side of, you know, we can talk about it a lot. We talk about love, we can talk about caring for each other, but there's an action that comes behind that really, I think. And so where does that come from? Well, the Bible is fairly clear that it's, uh, it comes from the fact that we love each other, that we have a, a closeness, that we are dear to each other. And the passage I'm going to share here today is a, a very dear passage to me uh, for that reason. And so as you begin there in verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 3 of chapter 2 of First Thessalonians, it says, Our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. 
So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this powerful truth that you have here before us, Lord. And as we look out into a new year, Father, we desire to have these characteristics here in this body of believers. Lord, not uh, uh, just a view of them, but in actuality, Father, that they would be something that is really going on behind the scenes down deep in our hearts, Father, that we would truly care for one another, truly love one another, and that everyone that walks through that door would have a sense of belonging, because truly that is what your church is, belonging to you, belonging with each other, and growing and uh, becoming a part of your kingdom and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Dear to us, this again is a part three of this uh, pastors, pulpits, and parishioners um, series, again, that I mentioned. Uh, but again, as we go into this new year, I'm sure many of you have those New Year's resolutions already. How many, how many of you have already worked out what you're going to work on in the coming year? Okay, we all kind of at least think about those. Sometimes we don't actually do it because we're getting older and we go, oh, I try that every year. It just doesn't work. You know, we come up with that resolution I'm going to work out. Boy, I'm going to get in good shape this year. I'm going to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to the beach. I'm going to climb those mountains. I'm going to go do all that that stuff that our heart desires to do, right? But the reality is often very different, isn't it? The, The reality is we are couch potatoes and we don't do any of that stuff really. Uh, Hopefully you're not drinking beer, but uh, certainly there is a a, a disparity between the resolution, what we desire to do, what we uh, inspired to do in our hearts, what we know we should do, and what we actually accomplish. And uh, the reality of that often is very discouraging. But we have within the Word of God a promise that as we desire to do those things that God desires us to do to fulfill his will. And as we pray to him and ask him for the power to accomplish that in our lives, he says, hey, if you pray according to my will, I'll do it for you. I'll give you that power. If you submit your will to me, I'll empower you to do those things. And so I think it's a great time for us in the church at the beginning of the year, just to refocus our thoughts upon these things and to really focus in on the things that matter. And that's what I was writing about the other day. I encourage you to check that out. It it gives you a a fuller view of what I'm going to be discussing here today as far as a vision for our coming year. But also this this idea of being dear to us. This is a passage of scripture that is... uh, it means a lot to me because it was a, a verse of scripture that the Lord gave me when I was just about to take over my first church after I'd retired from the Navy. Uh, I was uh, in contact with a church up in Northern California and they were discussing whether they were going to call me to be their pastor or not. And I was living nine and a half hours south of that town down in the Central Valley of California. And uh, so to get to them, it was quite a haul. And if you've ever been to Eureka, California, Humboldt County, California, it's up in the Redwoods and there is no easy way to get in there. It's not even easy to fly in there. It's so hard to get in there. And so to go there, to be with those people, to get to know them, uh, it was very difficult. It was a long way. It took a lot of money for our family to you know, drive back and forth, but we did it because in our hearts, we had a sense that God was drawing us to them. And this verse just jumped out at me one day, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. 
And that just screamed out at me. I said, yes, that's what I feel. I love those people and I'll drive. I'll make that drive. I'll go up there as many times as I need to, to make that drive, to go and to be with them, to get to know them, to impart to them. They were in a situation where a guy had taken over the church who himself had admitted, you know, I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to be a teacher. This is not my gifting. This is not my thing, but I'll do it until somebody else shows up. And the, the situation was that nobody else wanted to go there. Nobody else wanted to go up there. It was way out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, they just couldn't get anybody else to go. And so as a result, you know, the church had really languished for many years, and they were spiritually malnourished. <laughs> And they were really dying for somebody to come and to minister to them. And and we kind of found each other. The Lord brought us together in that way. And, uh, you know, our hearts were just knit together very quickly up there. And and, uh, just this sense of, I'll do anything. I'll drive nine and a half hours. I'll do whatever it takes to go and to minister to those people. Why? Because they've become dear to me. And, you know, this passage of scripture, you know, you could easily look at it and say, well, that's just for pastors. That's just for ministers. That's just for people in the ministry or who want to go into the ministry. And I say, no, it's not. It's for all of us. Because if we really want to be the kind of church that the Bible says is a, an approved church by God, is a church that is walking worthy of God then all of us, each and every one of us here in this room need to swallow these things and let them become part of us. And we really need to begin to love each other in a deeper way. We need to come to that place of saying, you know, I I love you so much, I'll lay down my life for you. And that's exactly what he's saying here. It's the equivalent of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the very same kind of a thing in the sense of what we can do as humans. Paul says, in the same way that God sent his own son down to this earth to lay down his life for you, and he did that because he loved you, Paul says, I affectionately long for you, or I I love you so much that I'm willing to come and lay down my life to give you everything that you need to attain salvation and to have that relationship with the Lord that you need to have. So it really is an amazing passage of Scripture that we're looking at here today. And uh, again, it goes along with this, uh, this article I wrote the other day. I want to share just a couple brief points with you just to give you an overview of it. I had printed out a copy and I meant to bring it in and make a bunch of copies if you want to look at it, but anyway... Um, just talking about the church and this sense of longing or belonging. Um, you know, last week on Christmas Day, I had such a, a wonderful experience here at the church as, uh, you know, we just had the Christmas lights on and we were singing those dear Christmas carols and uh, our candlelight service that we had and and just the, the mood that was here and, and people were just so happy and joyful and, and there was just that sense of belonging, that sense of longing for one another and caring for one another. And that carried right into the evening as uh, many of my closest family members came to my home and we had dinner and we laughed together and watched the Broncos together and, and just this great time of, of family being together. And uh, it was really a great time. And as a result, at the end of that day, Monday morning, I just kept thinking about those things. And it, and it just really came to my heart that, uh, you know, that's, that's how it's supposed to be. God, it's not an accident. God designed it to be that way. He designed the church to be that way. That we are a bunch of loving families coming together and, and individuals who love the Lord coming together and loving on each other, caring for one another and taking care of each other's needs and, and just that sense of belonging. And so I wrote, when functioning properly, the institution known as the church comprised of loving families and individual believers is uniquely equipped to fulfill these basic human needs in the heart of every man, to be loved, cared for, and welcomed in as a part of a family that truly exhorts and comforts and charges as a father does his own children. Of course, that's coming from our passage here today as well. Boy, do you want to be a part of that? 
I want to be a part of that. I don't care how big we get. I don't care if we have the nicest building in town. I don't care if we stay here for the next 15, 20 years. As long as we are a group of believers who love each other and care for each other and, and just have that sense of God is here with us and we belong here together. Now, if we're truly doing that, if we're truly loving each other in that way, then we can't help but grow, in my opinion. Uh, but growth is always the goal, it seems like, in church today. We need to grow. That's the thing. No, we don't need to grow. We need to love each other. We need to care for each other. We need to preach the word of God. And if we grow, praise the Lord. We should grow if we're healthy in that way. But growth is not the goal. Spiritual growth is more the goal, I think, that we're trying to achieve, and that's exactly what's being talked about here. The ultimate uh, maturity in a Christian believer is love, as we've talked about so many times. Love is the ultimate mark of, of growth and spiritual maturity. The English word church itself carries the idea of belonging, being derived from the Greek word kuriakon, the neuter adjective of kurios, which is the Lord. That's where we get the term the Lord from. And that means belonging to the Lord. That's what the, the name church means. A group of believers belonging to the Lord. That is what we're all about. The essence of what the body of Christ represents, an enormous gathering of those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he bought us with his blood. We belong to him. He paid a heavy, heavy price for us. And we are to become that physical expression of him upon the earth. We are his hands. We are his feet. And we are to carry on that love and that sacrificial love that he displayed for each and every one of us as we go forward. Well, again, I told you about that church up in Eureka. It's interesting. Uh, this is the building they were meeting in when I first arrived there. It's a poultry rabbit hutch at the state fairgrounds. <laughs> and every year, we had to move out of there for two months in the summertime and find somewhere else to go. Why? Well, because the chickens and the rabbits were in there. And it was harsh. It was a harsh situation. Very, very humble beginnings. I mean, you talk about this place. You talk about the school that we were in and, and the other building we were in. This place was humble, humble beginnings. I love that crack in the back door there. And you could sit there and watch as cars went by through that crack in the door. And it got pretty chilly there in the wintertime too. But, you know, it, it provided a place for us. We eventually moved into the local mall and that was like living in a, in a fishbowl right there as people went by. It was so funny. People walked by and they go, what, a church in the mall? That's awful. What about separation of church and state? Rah! And they just go off. You know, you'd hear them just screaming and being crazy. You know, it's like, whoa, you could just feel the hatred pouring in, you know. Or people would walk by, a church in the mall? Praise the Lord. That's awesome. You know, they would say stuff like that. But eventually we ended up in a in a old, old building. Um, they're still there today. They bought the building after I left. And uh, I think the building was built in like 1895 or something like that. Uh, very nice old building though. And it was, it accommodated us and it was nice. Um, but you know, the interesting thing is the church is not about buildings, is it? <laughs> it's not about buildings. And I'm so looking forward to being done with painting and sheetrocking and bathrooms and tile floors and kitchens and all that stuff so we can just focus in on what's really important and that's the people the people that's the body of Christ that's the church not the building I so want to focus in on that you know as I was putting these slides together yesterday I started noticing some of the the faces and the people in these pictures. And many of them have gone on to be with the Lord. Many of them have uh, run their race and now they're with the Lord. And I think, I'm sorry. I just think about that. The body of Christ. We're a family. We're a family. We need to love each other as a family loves each other. 
and cares for each other. And Paul, in this passage, is going to give us, he said, you know, cherish, I'm going to cherish you and, and be tender and caring for you like a nursing mother. And then he says later on, I, I want to exhort you and I charged you and I, and I comforted you and cared for you as a father does his own children. And that's the imagery that God wants to give us about his church, is we care for each other as a family cares for each other, as a family should care for each other. And when somebody hurts in that family, we hurt. And when they cry, we cry. When they laugh, we laugh. And that's my vision for the coming year. Last year, we talked a lot about doing evangelism. And, uh, you know, to some extent, I, I think we had some success in that area. Certainly, there are folks here in the church that have that gift and that calling and that, you know, desire to go out and do street witnessing and knock on doors and those kind of things. Um, but, you know, I, I think that Pastor Chuck had it right. He used to say, healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. And, and that's true. I, I think when we're healthy and when we have a healthy body of believers, that evangelism is a natural outworking of that, being healthy. If you love the Lord and you love your church and you feel like you belong to your church and they care for you and they love you, then you can't help but go tell other people, hey, you ought to come to my church. You ought to come to my church, man. They'll take care of you. And, and I think that's the way it should be. It's the way it should be. And so I have some encouragements here for you today. You know, I want to be approved by God here in this church. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the world's standards are about church growth and what makes you a healthy church and, and all that garbage that's out there. I want to be approved by God. If God approves of it, then we're okay. If God approves of what we're doing here, then we're okay. And I think there's some things in this passage that he shows us that give us that idea and I'll never be able to get through them all because we're running short on time already. But that's okay. Uh, ultimately, if we're approved by God, we can help others to walk that walk that is worthy of God and to come into God's kingdom. And so those are the two things I want to just briefly cover here today. Again, approved by God, he says there in verse 3, our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And we'll stop there for just a minute. But this idea of exhortation, uh, Paul came exhorting. Now, we often think that exhorting is kind of uh, just teaching and and, and giving you instruction, correction maybe, and, and certainly all those things apply to the idea of exhortation. But um, also there's a, there's a deeper thing that I think we need to understand. That's a comforting, that it, uh, exhortation is a comforting thing as well. It's a loving thing to do. And he said, I did that in truth. I did that in purity. You know, I, I wasn't deceitfully going around uh, lying to you or giving you error in order to build my own ministry or, or build up my own status as an apostle or any of those kind of things. And you have to understand that in Paul's time, uh, there were a lot of sh uh, charlatans going around. And that's the way they'd make a living. They would go around and, and they would butter people up and they would use flattering words to uh, get people to give them money. They would do whatever they needed to do in order to pad their own pockets a little bit. And certainly that is carried on today, uh, that there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on in the church today. There always has been, and that's because there's always been wolves within the church who want to fleece the sheep of God, who want to just say what needs to be said in order to butter people up, to flatter people uh, so that they'll loosen up their wallet a little bit and give some money and, and those kind of things. Uh, but Paul said, hey, you know, I exhorted you in truth, in purity. There was no error in my message. There was no, 
you know, hey, you can go out and, and get involved in sexual immorality all you want. It's okay, you know, and there was a lot of that going on in that day as well. A license. Uh, preachers were going around giving people license to go and indulge in the flesh, and that would make their ministry popular, you know, and you see that a little bit today as well. As people, uh, you know, they, they preach about things that they know people want to hear. They have itching ears. You know, I want to hear this stuff about, you know, making me, myself look positive and uh, positive confessions and, and uh, you know, propping myself up, you know, and those kind of things. Paul says, I didn't do any of that. I didn't hold back the truth from you. I didn't teach you a bunch of error just to build my own ministry. I came and I sincerely taught you what you needed to know. I didn't hold back. And I think a lot of times within the church, you know, we have this seeker-friendly mentality. You know, let's hold back on those real uh, hard truths of Scripture and uh, not tell people about that kind of stuff because the unchurched, they don't want to hear that. And really what it does, it just builds up that ministry. It builds up that church and just crowds that entire church with people who uh, don't really have a sincere desire to walk in holiness and in truth. They just uh, feel like they're a part of a club. And so they're going for that, hey, you belong here uh, thing because they haven't told people about their sin. They haven't told people the truth about confessing their sin and what God demands of them, what is approved by God, what is really truly walking worthy of God. They've held that stuff back because they know that unchurched people don't want to hear that. That's why they don't go to church. They don't want to hear that hard truth. They want to be comforted in their own sin. Paul said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell people what they need to hear because ultimately their salvation is at stake. Because the first time they have a hard time in life after they've accepted this false Jesus, this, this watered-down Christ, they know that, uh, hey, this is too hard. This is too hard. I came here because you guys told me everything was going to be great because God's going to give me a Cadillac and, and uh, God wants to bless me financially and all these other promises you made. They're not true. And so they turn their back and they walk away on Christ never to come back to the church again because they feel like they've been lied to. And that's the exact word that's being used here about deceit. The word in the Greek there that was used to talk about deceit was the idea of fishing. And you, you know, have a nice shiny little lure and you put a worm on that. You throw it out there and that little fish goes, hey, check it out. And he goes up and grabs onto that. And it's the same idea. It's deceit. We throw something out there to attract the crowds but it's deceitful. And as we think about that here and in our own ministries among each other and our our ministry to this community that we're in here, uh, that needs to be understood. That needs to be understood. We need to be sincere with people. We need to be truthful with people. We need to have lives that are holy and pure before people and and not uh, make any false uh, claims about anything in, the, in those kind of terms. It's interesting, this word exhortation. It's the same kind of root meaning of the word that we use to describe the Holy Spirit. The parakletos is the Greek word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper. And you think about para, para, parallel. You come alongside, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes alongside of us, and he helps us. He comforts us. He teaches us. He exhorts us. And so this word exhortation is the same idea. As we come alongside of each other, and we help each other, and we comfort each other, we exhort each other, we admonish one another, we encourage each other, we console, we comfort, we give solace to one another. We come alongside because the Holy Spirit is at work in and through us, through those spiritual gifts that he's given us. Oh, you thought the spiritual gifts were just so I can stand up and look spiritual? No. No, those are for other people here. They're not for you. They're not your gifts. They're for the body of Christ, to build up the body of Christ. And as the Holy Spirit is working through you, as you are being led by the Holy Spirit, 
not walking in your flesh, you're able to come alongside and the Holy Spirit is able to speak to you and say, hey, go sit with that sister over there. Go talk to that brother over there. That's my idea of what our, our break time is supposed to be. Not go get more coffee, not to go to the bathroom. Hey, go minister to each other. I would let it go on for a half an hour if that's what was happening. Okay, now we're going to have a half hour of ministering to each other. Go, do it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Visitors just wouldn't understand. They just, they'd be like, this is weird. We need to go. Come on, honey. But that's the idea. Every one of us has the Holy Spirit dwelling inside. And he desires to use us in a way to come alongside and to minister to one another. Paraclete. The rabbis called the Messiah the consoler, the comforter. That's interesting because Jesus used that same idea in John 14 and many other places in the book of John. He said, uh, the comforter or the helper in the New King James is the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Ghost. And I will send him. I, when I go and I go to my father, I'll send the comforter to you and he will come alongside. I won't be with you anymore, but the comforter will come and he'll come alongside of you and he'll encourage you and build you up. And so being the body of Christ, we are now tasked with that, to allow the Holy Spirit to use us in that same way, to encourage in truth, to exhort in purity and in sincerity. We are entrusted with this gospel. Have you ever thought about that? The gospel message, we've been entrusted with it. He's given it to us. What have we done with it? What have we done with the gospel message in the last year? Think about that. Now, I'm not trying to con condemn you here. You have been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message that has the power to save somebody from going to hell and to give them eternal life. What did you do with it last year? Be honest. Be honest with yourself. What did you do with that message? You were entrusted with it. What did you do with it? We all want to stand there before God as he says, come in, well done, good and faithful servant. But he entrusted you with that message of the gospel. What did you do with it? Were you faithful with it? Were you faithfully taking that message and giving it to others? Or were you holding on to it? Paul says in the beginning of this passage, hey, we were bold. We came to you in boldness. Even though we had just come from this town where they had just beat us to death. <laughs> we show up in your town, we're still bleeding, we're still bruised and sore. But in boldness, we told you what you needed to know in truth, sincerity, and purity. You're entrusted with that message. Take it out, give it to others. Don't seek to please men, seek to please God. And I think that's a big failing in the church today. We're, we're men pleasers. We're trying to make men happy, man happy, rather than looking at what God expects from us and seeking to please him. It's a real danger in the ministry. It's a real danger to just try to make everybody happy. Well, I don't want to say that. You know, I don't want to do that. Everybody will get upset and people will leave the church and da, da, da. You know, those are the kind of mind games that Satan plays with you when you're in the ministry. You just want to please people. Just try to make everybody happy. You know what you do when you make every, try to make everybody happy? You don't make anybody happy. You make everybody mad at you. You're going to offend somebody. Get used to it. Paul got used to it, and he got beat for it. But Paul said, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. I don't care if man likes the message or not. He needs to hear it. If man's not pleased with the message, I don't care. I was entrusted with the message and I gave it to man anyway, is what Paul says. Anything less, I'm not a disciple of Christ. I'm not a servant of Christ. I'm a man pleaser. I'm just trying to make people like me. No good. No good. Think about that as we go forward in the coming year. Don't be a man pleaser.
Please God. Seek to please him. Minister, don't manipulate. I think this is a key in, in all ministry. And we've talked about it a little bit. I don't want to go into great detail, but we have this, you know, man-pleasing mentality that, uh, you know, you think about, again, coming from a pastor's perspective and somebody in ministry, you know, there is always this in the back of your mind, you know, what if nobody shows up on Sunday? Ah, you know, and so you, you have a tendency to try to manipulate people and you want to make people happy. And I hate it when I, when I sense that I'm doing it. And I do, you know, you, you go and you, oh, how are you? You know, you, it's fine, but it, it's got to be genuine. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be real. And I think once we take these kind of concepts that Paul is saying, hey, we didn't come to you like that. We didn't come to you trying to manipulate you into getting your money. We came to you with the truth and we gave it to you. We weren't trying to manipulate you. We were trying to minister to you the word of God. I remember last year I went down to um, Guatemala and I was invited to come and speak at a kind of a pastor's conference and, uh, you know, all these um, Mayan Indian pastors that lived up in the mountains that were pastoring churches up there and, and some of the Spanish ministers and uh, the native Guatemalans there. Anyway, I, I just brought some principles of ministry and, and just shared those with them. And this is always one that I bring. You know, minister to people, don't manipulate. Just don't even think about trying to manipulate them into staying at your church and tithing and, and all the rest of it, all that stuff. Don't even worry about that. Your job is to minister to people. Don't get involved in trying to manipulate them into staying at your church and to build your church bigger or any of those kind of things. It certainly goes on. Why? Because we're human. Uh, we're frail. And, um, you know, we're not being led by the Spirit. We're striving in the flesh oftentimes. And so you think about that as you minister to each other here. There should not, not be any false motives as we talk to each other, as we pray for each other, as we care for each other. Let love be without all of that baggage and all that garbage attached to it. A pure sense of loving that person, caring for that person. Seek humility, not glory. He says there, um, neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, as a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles. Hey, if anybody could go, go around glorying and have kind of a high and mighty attitude, it would be Paul, right, in the church. I mean, he was, he was awesome. I mean, he was just an incredible guy. Powerful ministry. But Paul says, I'm not seeking my own glory. I want to give glory to God. I want to deflect any glory that comes to me and give it right to God. Deflect that glory. Give it to the Lord. But as we serve in the church and as we minister to each other and desire positions, you know, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should become the pastor. Maybe I should become the assistant pastor. Maybe I should run that ministry. Maybe I should run that ministry. Those kind of things. Sometimes we really have to check ourselves. We always have to check ourselves, I should say, and ensure that our motivation is pure, that I'm not trying to climb into a position of authority, that I'm not trying to gain power and glory for myself, but that I am just desiring to be used by the Lord in a powerful way. And if he wants to put me in a position that has a title, great. If he doesn't, that's great too, as long as I can be used by the Lord in that way. So be humble. Don't seek the glory. God will give you all the credit you need. Don't you worry about it. The other thing I think is important here too is God is watching. God is witness, he says. God is witness of these things. And I think that's something we always have to keep in mind. In our home, um, you know, in our own time alone, as we're driving our car, 
and yelling at people as they pass us. <laughs> like that old comedian used to say, have you ever noticed anyone driving faster than you is a maniac? Anybody driving slower than you is an idiot. You know, and uh, we're all out there doing that road rage thing from time to time. I've seen you. No, <laughs> I haven't seen any of you, but God saw you every time. God saw you every time. And he knows the hypocrisy of our hearts when here on Sunday morning we have this <laughs> kind of look to us. But he knows what's going on in our hearts. He knows what's going on deep down inside. And these things do leak out and they show themselves. But even if they don't, understand God is watching. God is witness of the things that we're doing. And so we need to be ever mindful of that. Am I pleasing God? It's easy to please men for the most part. It's very difficult to please God because our flesh gets in the way so often. So be mindful of that. A couple of other exhortations as he goes through the rest of it. And I'm not going to go through the whole passage because I know we are running a bit long, all the events we had today. But he says there in verse 7, We were gentle among you as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. But then the key passage again there is verse 8, Affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, laboring night and day, and he goes on and on. He says, we're laboring, we're working. We didn't want to become a burden to you. Oftentimes when ministries go down from the United States to foreign countries to do missionary work, the people that they're going down there to serve, quote unquote, are burdened because of our American lifestyle. And, oh, we got to have this and we got to have this and you got to make sure we got this and this kind of food and this, you know, these arrangements. And, and so the people we're going down there to minister to work themselves to death to try to please the, the ministers that are going to come down and minister to them. And we go down and say a few words and and uh, preach a little bit here and there, and then off we go back to the United States. And the people down there are going, what a blessing. It's really nice to have those Americans come down here and bless us like that. (laughs) Walking worthy of the Lord, though, we are to be gentle and cherishing, just like a nursing mother. I'm so amazed by my wife. She raised six kids, six kids, while most of the time I was halfway around the world on some aircraft carrier or some base somewhere around the world while she was raising those kids. And I'm just amazed by her for doing that. Even when I was around, you know, it seemed like we were always pregnant or just had a baby or, you know, (laughs) having one soon or something, you know. And, you know, she worked a part-time or a full-time job most of those years. And, uh, but she would get up 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, whatever time it was, and she'd take care of those kids. And I'd say, sure, sure, I'm glad you're breastfeeding, honey. I just, <laughs> I can keep sleeping, you know, in that way. No. Nobody laughed at that. Boy, I was just joking. Okay. All the women are like, yeah, we know you're not joking. That's why. But it's amazing what a mother will do. The amount of sleep that she'll sacrifice for that little baby. Because she knows that little baby needs the nourishment. It's amazing what a mother will go through for that child. She'll lay her life down. She'll lay down everything, the pain, the suffering, the agony that she'll go through. And that's why when they get on the TV and they say, hey, mom, it's not the dad. The dad didn't lay down that kind of sacrifice. (laughs) The kid knows, hey, mom took care of me. Thanks, mom. Thanks, mom. Nourishing mother. Paul says that's the way the church should be treating each other. That's the way we should be treating each other laying our own lives down, caring for and nurturing 
uh, each other in the Lord, in the things of the Lord. Gentle, cherishing. And again, it comes back to this idea. I said this at the beginning, but I, I do think this is the equivalent in, in the sense of what we're called to do. In the same way that God loved the world and gave his own son, Paul says, I also, I loved you guys so much. I came and I was willing to lay down my own life for your sakes and for the sake of the gospel so that the gospel could go forward. Hit the wrong button, sorry. Clark says, uh, we have his, his translation of this a little bit or commentary on this. He says, we had such intense love for you that we were not only willing to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to you, but also to give our own lives for your sake because you were dear, because, you, uh, because ye were beloved by us. The words used here by the apostle are expressive of the strongest affection and attachment and are found nowhere else in the New Testament. This is a powerful, powerful statement. Affectionately longing for you. We're willing to lay down everything, our entire lives, because you were dear to us. You had become dear to us. And as we go forward in the coming year, I encourage you, if you're going to make any New Year's resolution, make it that one right there. Allow the people in this room right, near, right now to become so dear to you that you'd be willing to lay down your life. That's a high calling, isn't it? But that's exactly what God calls us to do. It's exactly what the Lord calls us to do in his word. In the same way that I sent my son to die for your sins, I want you to lay down your life for these people right here. Amen? Well, I'm going to zip through the rest of these. I, I think we've covered this already, but uh, again, not only the gospel, not only are we going to teach you the word of God and give you the words that you need to know, but we're going to back it up with our lives. And I think Paul was very concerned about this. Throughout his ministry, he said things like this. To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. I'll do anything to a degree. <laughs> I'll do anything. If people are weak, I'll be weak with them. In whatever way they need to be ministered to, I'll do those things so we can win them to the Lord. And that's not to say to compromise, and we don't have time to expound on that. But uh, again, it's work. It's work. It's not easy. I mean, these things sound great, and your heart may be stirred by these things, but it's not easy. It's not easy to labor and toil night and day to care for the needs of people. We've just begun... Uh, I've asked a, a few couples here in the church to uh, volunteer to be in the deacon's ministry. We haven't had a deacon's ministry yet, but as we grow, I think, again, this is what we need. We need those people to wait on tables, to care for the needs of others, to labor and toil night and day. You guys didn't know I was going to ask you to do that, did you? <laughs> I didn't share this verse with you. <laughs> I got you now. <laughs> Um, but it is work. It is work to care for the needs of people. And uh, are you willing to get your hands dirty? Are you willing to get your hands dirty? Are you willing to get in there and, and get dirty? I, I think I've told this story before. I was uh, ministering to some folks at uh, a rescue mission out in California. I know, I know, I'm going late. You guys don't mind, right? <laughs> Everybody's getting late. Um, and you know, that was a tough ministry. It really was. These guys' lives were so broken and hooked on drugs and, and just, you would not believe the, the broken lives that we dealt with there. But I remember one day we'd gotten out of church and we went down to Applebee's and we we're going to have lunch. And, uh, as I was getting out of my car, there was this, um, area behind the mall area there that's kind of overgrown and uh, trees everywhere and it's kind of a swamp and a bunch of homeless people would live down there. There was like, it was the no-go zone. Talk about those no-go zones over in Europe. That was the no-go zone. You didn't go back there because you just didn't know what was going on back there. 
And, but there were people living back in those swamps. And, uh, and as I was getting out of my car, a guy walked out of that swamp. And he was filthy. I mean, filthy, filthy, filthy. Hair all crazy. And, and you could just tell his clothes were just filthy. His face was dirty. And as I looked over at him, I realized I knew him. I knew him. It was one of those guys that I used to minister to at the rescue mission who had gone back into his life of drug addiction and whatever he was involved in. And I looked and it just broke my heart. But he saw me and he was just, you know, and he came right over to me and wanted to give me a big old hug. And I was like, you know. Because I, I was dressed for church, you know, I don't dress up. I didn't, wasn't wearing a suit or anything, but I was dressed for church. And, um, and boy, I mean, five feet before he got to me, I could smell him. And it was one of those. It was a very sad situation. I heard another pastor talk about it in the sense that uh, some, something similar happened to him. And the Lord spoke to his heart as he was hugging that person. And he said, I just wanted you to see what I smell coming off of you sometimes. <laughs> but the point is, you know, ministry is dirty. It smells. And sheep bite. And it's hard sometimes. And you get attacked. There's spiritual warfare going on. And, and all these things are happening within the, the ministry. And you're in it. If you're in the body of Christ, you're a minister. Want to or not, you're in the ministry. It's not just for pastors. There's label, there's toil for the sake of the gospel. And I'm just going to end with that. So are you ready to volunteer? Are you ready to jump right in there and uh, get involved with that in the coming year? I hope you are. (laughs) All of the, the negatives that I've just shared with you Paul says they, they don't compare. They don't compare to the glory, to how incredible the reward is in heaven. As we lay our lives down on this earth, we are rewarded in heaven in ways that we cannot even fathom. And that's okay with me. So in the coming year, I encourage you to consider these things in your own life. If you've been convicted about some of these things, that's good. Repent. Repent, but also return to a heart seeking after the Lord and seeking to be used by the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your truth. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come alongside of you as you've come alongside of us and to minister to become a body of believers that loves each other and cares for each other. A body of believers that belong to you and have a sense of belonging here. Father, we submit our hearts to you in every way needed. Lord, we surrender the desires of our own flesh because we want to be vessels that can be used by you in 2017. Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We want to please you and not men. Father, help us to do this. Pour out your Holy Spirit on every person in this room right now, Lord, I pray. Lord, that you would come alongside in comfort, that you would fill up those areas that are lacking. By your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.